I'm Steve Marshall, artist and pastor on staff at Willowbrook United Methodist Church. And today I want to go back to the Old Testament and look at a familiar story that we all probably heard as children in Sunday school, or perhaps at our grandfather's knee. A grandchild sitting on her grandfather's lap listening to the Bible story of Noah's Ark asked, Were you in the Ark, Grandpa? He chuckled and replied, Why, no, I wasn't. There was a pause, and the child looked up at him quizzically and asked, Then why weren't you drowned? I think I know how that grandfather felt, because I'm feeling older every day. Let me read from the Old Testament book of Genesis, chapter 6, verses 9 to 22. This is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Jepheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. So God said to Noah, I am going to put an end to all people, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I am surely going to destroy both them and the earth. So make yourself an ark of cypress wood. Make rooms in it and coat it with pitch inside and out. This is how you are to build it. The ark is to be 300 cubits long, 50 cubits wide, and 30 cubits high. Make a roof for it, leaving below the roof an opening one cubit high all around. Put a door in the side of the ark and make lower, middle, and upper decks, for I am going to bring flood waters on the earth to destroy all life under the heavens, every creature that has the breath of life in it. Everything on earth will perish. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you will enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. You are to bring into the ark two of all living creatures, male and female, to keep them alive with you. Two of every kind of bird, of every kind of animal, and every kind of creature that moves along the ground will come to you to be kept alive. You are to take every kind of food that is to be eaten and store it away as food for you and for them. And Noah did everything just as God commanded him. Now, the story of Noah and the Ark is usually relegated to Sunday school or children's stories, and maybe because we have done that, we've missed some of the most important lessons God has for us from stories like Adam and Eve, and David and Goliath, Joseph and his coat of many colors, and others. We live in an age of biblical illiteracy. Very few people know even the most popular stories of the Bible. But even with that, there are very few people who have not heard of Noah's Ark. There are cartoons about it, movies made of it, toys, and even jewelry and clothing depicting it. Children enjoy hearing about the animals and the big boat and the rainbow and how God rescued Noah and his family. But really, this story of Noah is a sobering account of divine judgment upon all of humankind. In almost all of the ancient world history, <clears throat> there are catastrophic flood stories. Anthropologists have collected about 275 such stories. The biblical story of Noah and the Ark is important for what it can teach us about God and God's plan for our salvation. Even Jesus knew the story and said, When the Son of Man returns, it will be like it was in Noah's day. In those days before the flood, the people were enjoying banquets and parties and weddings right up to the time Noah entered his boat. People didn't realize what was going to happen until the flood came and swept them all away. This is the way it will be when the Son of Man comes. 
Let's look at what the story of Noah's Ark actually tells us. <clears throat> First, we learn that God's heart was broken at the sinfulness of his creation. God sees the evil in our lives. I wonder sometimes if we fully understand that God truly is watching us. He sees the evil in our lives and in our world. When we think it's just a little sin or when we think we can get away with one thing or the other, God sees. God is not blind to how we live our lives. He sees our joys and our sorrows, our righteousness and our sinfulness. He sees where we go, what we look at, what we listen to. Yeah, that makes you think twice, doesn't it? A second thing we learn is that God will not contend with sin forever. God is patient. He's kind and loving. But we learn that God will not put up with sin forever. And there came a point in Noah's day where the people had crossed a line. They had sunk to a level of sinful living where God's patience had run out. Why? Because God does not tolerate sin. And this story of Noah tells us without question that God takes sin seriously. Now, here's the heart of the story. <clears throat> God holds us accountable for our thoughts and actions. God holds us accountable for our sin. The sinner, and that's you and me, must take responsibility for their sin. We have to own it. That is what leads to repentance. I am a sinner. God, forgive me. In Noah's day, they didn't think much about their sin or God. Our society today glamorizes sin. The Boston Globe newspaper ran an article not too long ago on recent books and movies that glamorize serial killers. We seem to live in a culture of death, in a morally toxic society where lies have become truth and sin is its own virtue in a world turned upside down. <clears throat> God knew what he was doing when he told us not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He knew we would choose evil over good. We would rebel. That's our depravity. The heart is deceitful among all things, and God's heart aches. So God chose to send a message to the world, a message that he will not overlook sin, and while God will not overlook sin, God is also merciful. God chose to spare one man and his family, Noah. Now, Genesis tells us that Noah was a righteous man and blameless among the people of his time. Noah walked with God by faith as a living example to those around him. Noah means rest or comfort. He found his rest, his comfort in God because no one else apparently was living that way. Do we follow God even when those around us are going in other directions? Noah conformed to God's standards and expectations, not the world's. It doesn't mean Noah was sinless. What it does mean is that he had a relationship, a daily walk with God, a deep communion with God. And Noah was obedient. Noah did everything just as God commanded him. Noah built the entire ark before the first raindrop ever fell. Before the earth opened up and the flood waters rose, the ark was there. And the ark was big. It was 450 feet in length, 75 feet wide, 45 feet high. It wasn't something you could hide. Noah's was not a private faith. Noah's faith was as great as the boat he was building. Now, how ridiculous do you think Noah looked building that ark? How ridiculous does your obedience look in the eyes of the world? Does your obedience look comfortable, safe, warm, doable? 
Or does your obedience look courageous, noticeable, risky, challenging? I imagine Noah got ridiculed quite a bit about what he was doing, but still Noah was faithful. We're told when everything was ready, God told Noah and his family to go into the boat with the animals and provisions, and Noah did it, and life survived. And then in chapter 8, verse 1, we're told those wonderful words that I'm sure we all would want to hear. God remembered Noah. Now here's the deep significance of this story. This is the transition right here from judgment to grace. We often call this story the Great Flood or Noah's Ark. Perhaps what it really needs to be called is God's Rainbow. Even though the world was wiped out, God still gave the world a second chance through Noah and his family. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21, Peter compares the ark to baptism, life rising out of death. From the shelter of the ark, out of the death and devastation of the flood, a new world rose. Now keep in mind, there was only one door into the ark, and there is only one gospel. Jesus is the door. For us, Jesus is the ark. He rescues us from death. In Noah's day, simply knowing there was an ark didn't save anybody. It was being in the ark that saved Noah and his family. And we have to be in the ark too. It is being in Christ that saves us. It's not enough to know about Jesus. We have to know Jesus in here, in our heart. Jesus says that when the Son of Man returns, it will be like in Noah's time. People were living their normal lives right up until the time that Noah entered the ark. People didn't realize what was happening until the flood came. The ark was a sign from God that they ignored at their peril. The adult version of Noah's ark is what we would today call a tragic love story. The flood was horrible, but in the end, there's a happy ending. In the end, there is a rainbow. In the end, there is God's promise of forgiveness and grace. In the end, there is a heavenly sign of God's everlasting love. That is a message of hope for us today. Praise be to God. Amen.